Welcome, everyone. We are so pleased to have you with us here today as we continue our 2023 Inside U.S. Foreign Policy Virtual Series. Today's webinar aims to explore a critically important foreign policy issue, namely the subject of global food security. Our focus today will include the important perspective of one of the State Department's diplomatic missions with a multilateral focus, the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, or UN, food agencies in Rome. We will also be joined by experts from the State Department's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. Additionally, we'll explore efforts to address food insecurity in South and Central Asia through the lens of our colleagues at the U.S. Mission to Sri Lanka. And in a first for the Inside U.S. Foreign Policy series, I am delighted to welcome colleagues from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, or the FAO, who will lead one of today's breakout sessions where they will share information and advice on UN careers with a particular emphasis on employment pathways for Americans. Beyond insights into US policy and our efforts to address and safeguard food security around the world, today's program will eluc elucidate the broader US foreign policy process, along with offering helpful information on State Department scholarship, internship, fellowship, and career opportunities. My name is Heidi Manley, and I am the chief of the USA Study Abroad Branch within the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. In this role, I guide the State Department's efforts to increase and diversify Americans taking part in study abroad through our USA Study Abroad programs, such as the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program, the Critical Language Scholarship, or CLS program, and our ideas program, which builds study abroad capacity at US colleges and universities, among other initiatives. These programs support our broader US foreign policy through the individual experiences and relationships formed through international education. Among the most urgent foreign policy challenges facing the United States and nations around the world is ensuring global food security. As you will hear more about soon, achieving global food security means that all people have access to safe, nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. It is essential for poverty reduction, economic growth, and political stability. Our keynote speaker and our expert panel today will provide a rare behind the scenes look at the tireless efforts of the State Department's diplomatic and technical effort experts to address global food security as an urgent foreign policy priority. And if you're wondering about the connection between today's foreign policy challenges and State Department scholarships and fellowships, the simple answer is that the United States is committed to fostering the next generation of diverse American leaders with critical global skills. The State Department's efforts to increase and diversify study abroad opportunities for all Americans are vital to developing the next generation of talented American professionals in all walks of life, including as diplomats advancing U.S. foreign policy efforts in service to the American people. For those of you interested in a career at the State Department, today's event will provide you with a front row seat as we explore the connections between study abroad and State Department careers. And it isn't just the State Department that is looking for talented Americans to join their rank, our ranks. During our second hour, as I just mentioned, please join our colleagues from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization to learn more about UN careers. It is through our Gilman program that we are hosting today's event. Today's webinar is the fifth in our Inside US Foreign Policy series, a six part virtual series focusing on the major foreign policy challenges facing the United States and the world today. Our Gilman program provides outstanding US undergraduate students who receive federal Pell Grants with scholarships to study or intern abroad. Since the program began in 2001, more than 41,000 Gilman scholars of diverse backgrounds from all US states and territories have studied abroad in over 150 countries. Finally, I am pleased to invite you all to attend our next Inside U.S. Foreign Policy webinar, focusing on the topic of technology, innovation, and the CHIPS Act. This webinar will take place January 2024. Registration will open soon.
And now it is my pleasure to introduce a video from Dr. Carrie Fowler, the U.S. Special Envoy for Global Food Security. Dr. Fowler, Fowler is a renowned agriculturalist with decades of experience in leading multilateral efforts to address the global food security challenges. His service in this role comes at a time when the world is facing unprecedented threats to food security due to climate change, armed conflict, and lingering impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Fowler is best known as the father of the, of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, a remarkable facility that safeguards over a million unique crop varieties representing the foundation of global agriculture. His expertise spans various aspects of food security, including crop diversity, seed conservation, and sustainable agricultural practices. The Special Envoy for Global Food Security is essential to coordinating U.S. efforts to address global food security challenges, and Dr. Fowler plays a pivotal role in advancing U.S. food security, hunger, and nutrition objectives through diplomatic engagement with allies and partners. Dr. Fowler works closely with the U.S. Agency for International Development's Feed the Future initiative and engages with a wide range of stakeholders, including governments, the private sector, academia, researchers, international organizations, civil society, and Congress. I now invite you to watch this video from Dr. Carrie Fowler. Hello, my name is Carrie Fowler, and I'm the Special Envoy for Global Food Security at the U.S. Department of State. We're all here because we care about food security, but I think there's one other thing that joins us as well. We have a nagging suspicion that something about this global food crisis is different. Something is different this time. The numbers of food insecure people are greater. The crises seem to be more frequent. The causes seem to be larger in number, and they seem to be more intractable, not just one-off or temporary. Since the late 1970s, we've had an unbroken string of months in which the global average temperature for that month exceeded the 20th century average. Something really is different. This is not a moment where business as usual is the appropriate response. Business as usual is not going to give us the amount of change needed to reverse course and to avoid disaster. In agriculture, sometimes incremental change is necessary. You can't always take a big leap forward. Small steps are required. But since the Green Revolution days, more than a half a century ago, we've become accustomed to incremental change. And I think one message I want to give you today is maybe we shouldn't become so accustomed to that. Maybe it's something we can't bank on. We know that the current pace of incremental change in crop yields, for example, is going to leave us far short of where we need to be by 2050. So we need to think boldly. We need to act boldly. We need some game-changing developments in agriculture and food security. Earlier this year, we announced the Vision for Adapted Crops and Soils, or VACS as we're calling it. VACS was premised on the understanding that food security fundamentally depends on fertile soils and adapted crops. Or, put another way, degraded soils and unadapted crops are never going to provide for food security. Even today's production levels might not be sustainable. VACS aims to foster more resilient food systems by developing climate resilient, nutritious crop varieties and building healthy, fertile soils. Initially, we're focusing VAX on Africa. It's the region with the greatest need and the greatest potential. On soils, we seek to help African governments and farmers answer four fundamental questions, all of which require data and analysis that my government and our farmers here have and which are mostly lacking in Africa. We need to remedy that. The first question is where to plant. The answer to that question will help governments to promote effective land use planning, underpin infrastructure development that they're undertaking, and of course, under, underpin better food production itself. Second question, what to plant, will help farmers and governments make good decisions to maximize productivity, resilience, and nutrition. 
Third question, what management system to employ? That's where we have to integrate everything we know about the environment, the soils, the crop varieties to help farmers make informed decisions. And the fourth question, how do we apply all that in a given year, in a given season? That's where we hope to expand the access to hyperlocal, timely recommendations to help farmers make the kind of management decisions in real time that they need to better manage their input, such as fertilizer. Africa is the continent where precision agriculture is more needed than anywhere else in the world. The farmers need that kind of detailed scientific knowledge about their soils that good management, sustainable practices, and productive agriculture require. With the soils work, we're working with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the CGIAR, the International Fertilizer Development Center, and others through our USAID Feed the Future initiative. On the crop side, we have partnered with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and the African Union and many others on a three-step program. We know that over-reliance on a few staples is risky and in the best of years it can't provide an adequate diet or balanced nutrition for everyone. The good news is that Africa is rich with nutritious traditional and indigenous crops. African traditional and indigenous crops have suffered from years of neglect and underinvestment. The Africa Union's common position on food systems makes this point over and over again. Expanding the spotlight and investments in these crops can unlock the potential to provide better nutrition, rebuild soils, support local communities and their cultures, and strengthen resilience. One of the things that really thrills me the most is that most of these crops we're talking about are tended by women and serving the interest of women farmers in Africa serves the interest of children. The first step was to look at all those traditional and indigenous crops in Africa and ask which of those crops have the most potential for providing more nutrition. We narrowed the list down from 300 to 60. The next step is going to be to look at those 60 crops and ask how are they going to do in a climate changed world. On the basis of knowing which crops have the most nutritional value and most potential to provide good production in Africa, we can make informed decisions on crop breeding and other efforts. And then the third effort is to establish the mechanisms needed to support that kind of work in a sustainable and in a fundamental way. This doesn't mean that the United States or any of us involved are abandoning our work on major crops. It simply means that we're adding to this and taking advantage of the really tremendous cost-benefit ratio and the human health benefits that some of these traditional and indigenous crops offer. What are these crops? Well, they're crops like pigeon pea and grass pea, loblob and American yam bean, African yam bean. All those are legumes that will help build soil as well. Spider plant, moringa, and phonio, and African eggplant, and African custard apple. But there are also some crops that are fairly familiar to us that are major crops but still need much more work, and that's sorghum and finger millet, okra, yams, cowpea. We could go on and on. The program that I'm talking about is not going to solve all problems. No program could but it does address two fundamental prerequisites for food security, having good soils and having good crops. So I want today to ask you to please join us. This effort is one that many governments and institutions are joining. We in the United States, along with the African Union and FAO, have catalyzed it. To strengthen food security and increase resilience, we need the kind of intergenerational and transformative initiatives that we're proposing today with FACTS. And for this to happen, which it must, we need a dramatic change in the conversation that we're having about food security, a change in the dialogue. I hope this event contributes to that kind of conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. What an outstanding, and as the granddaughter of farmers myself, um, thought-provoking message, especially thinking about female farmers and their role in the world. 
Um, now it is my absolute great pleasure to turn the microphone over to our public affairs officer at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. in Rome, Ms. Naomi Matos. Naomi, over to you. Thank you so much, Heidi, um, for the introduction and lovely opening. And thank you all in the virtual audience for joining us. Um, once again, my name is Naomi Matos, and I'm the public affairs officer for our U.S. mission to the U.N. Food and Agriculture Agencies in Rome, Italy. And before we begin, I'd also like to thank U.S. Special Envoy for Global Food Security, Dr. Kerry Fowler, for his keynote address, which did an excellent job setting the stage and framing our conversation today. Like Dr. Fowler said, the current once-in-a-lifetime global food crisis requires urgent and bold action. And our expert panelists will speak to the US government's commitment to deliver just that. So I'm delighted to moderate our expert panel today who will share their experience as part of a team working to advance US foreign policy on global food security. So um, after we do some introductions and some pre-planned questions, we will then open it up for the discussion and Q&A. So as we go along, please submit your questions via the chat box. We look forward to hearing from you. So without further ado, let's get to our expert panel. If we could have the panelists turn on their videos and unmute themselves. Um, so joining me today is Ronit Gerard, Senior Development Advisor for the U.S. Mission to the U.N. Agencies in Rome and Paul Harrison, the Director of the Office of Agricultural Policy for the U.S. Department of State, and Heidi Hattenbach, um, Public Affairs Officer of the U.S. Embassy to Sri Lanka. So first, let's go around the table for a brief two to three minute self-introductions. So when you guys introduce yourselves, if you could please um, summarize your career with State, or in Ronit's case, USAID, uh, the work you all are doing currently and how it's connected to the subject of global food security, and for the benefit of our students and program alumni, let's also include your academic background and study abroad experience and your motivation for coming to work at State or USA. So Ronit, how about you start us off? Great, thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, as Naomi said, my name is Ronit Gerard. Um, I work for the US Agency for International Development. Um, and um, just a little bit about how I kind of ended up here. Um, I, uh, without going way back, <laughs> um, I do come from um, a large family of um, volunteerism and um, support. And I think that's where I first kind of got that, that urge to, to, to be part of the solution. Um, and then of course, uh, when I was in university, I did my junior year abroad and got to experience some travel opportunities and experience um, different ways of living. And then I was also a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, which um, just kind of helped build up my interest and desire in becoming a foreign service officer and particularly studying agriculture and global food security, which is how I have eventually ended up here in Rome as um, one of the senior development advisors. Um, the work that I, 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 excuse me, Naomi, I'm sure, I'm not sure, do you want us to go into more significant detail than that or would you like us to hold off a little bit about? No, that was perfect, Roni, that was okay. perfect. There you um, go. All right, so let's hand it over to Paul, Paul Harrison, over to you. Thank you, Naomi, appreciate it. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Paul Harrison. I'm a foreign service officer with Department of State. Um, I happen to be a political officer, although I've worked in the Economic Bureau here uh, since uh, 2020. Um, originally from Southern Illinois, although you uh, also probably hear my voice, I'm from the Carolinas and East Tennessee. Um, and so, uh, you know, from those kind of, uh, those beginnings, and I'm from a family in Southern Illinois that I don't think left except for, you know, when they got drafted, they didn't leave Illinois pretty much for about 200 years. Um, but I had the benefit of growing up with a lot of folks with international exposure. I went, I was lived in a university town, had a lot of, uh, of folks um, who were from somewhere else as a kid. And so I was always interested in that and always sparked that. Um, so as an undergrad, 
Furman University in South Carolina. I was a history major. I thought that was really interesting. And then I went and worked on a master's um, back in, in Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois, and did uh, diplomatic history and looked also at some at U.S. agricultural history, uh, which now seems prescient, but at the time was just a fun class to take, right? Um, and worked on things like elephant ivory trade ban, right? So I was always interested in that stuff. And then I was in law school in Tennessee and took a foreign service exam, having to pass a test. And instead of going and practicing commercial law and doing trust in the states type stuff, in a real nice town in southwestern Virginia, I joined the foreign service and went to Guyana for my first post, which is down in South America, which I learned is down in South America, because um, I didn't necessarily know that when I came into the foreign service, right? Um, but that's okay. Lots of other folks don't know that either, right? Uh, after that, I spent a lot of time in, in Europe. I was in Berlin. I was in uh, the U.S. NATO office here. I was in the NATO office here in, in D.C. And then I was at U.S. NATO. Um, and then I worked at Air Mobility Command with U.S. Air Force as a foreign policy advisor. So it gave me a lot of good experience. And then I went to Madagascar. And in Madagascar, I saw stunting. And I saw poverty like I'd never seen before anywhere in the world, even in Guyana, which was an extremely poor country. Um, in Madagascar, 92% of the people lived on $1.50 a day or less. Um, and I had to drive to work every day and recognize that I could not stop and hand $5 to the person on the side of the street. I needed to get into the office and work on the macro problem. I needed to help a U.S. company bring electricity to the capital or you know, some investor you know, create jobs for people so we could change the macro equation. Um, and so that kind of led me here to where I'm at today, working in the agricultural policy office on food security, because I've seen what food security means and how much it matters in a place like Madagascar. Um, and for us, you know, food security is national security. And so we work on that on a daily basis. And I will leave it there for me. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. We're going to finish up with Heidi. So, hey, it's a pleasure to be with you all. My name is Heidi Hottenbach. I'm the public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy here in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where it's like 9.30 something p.m. So different side of the world from you all. Um, like many of my colleagues who have just spoken, um, I wasn't particularly an obvious foreign service officer candidate either. In fact, I, I didn't hear about it until well after college. I look back, I, I studied um, economics. I actually didn't um, thrive in college, I didn't love it. I, I wanted to do stuff in the world. I wanted to be action oriented and make a difference. And so coming out of college, I did a lot of that. I um, I was you know, more in an activist in the policy space. I, um, I, I frankly, I, I lived a lot of dreams. I chased a lot of dreams. I'm grateful I did that. I spent a year biking across Africa. I, I worked for a while flying trapeze for a circus. Like I, I, um, I'm not an obvious foreign service officer, but part of what I love about the foreign service is that we are this cross section of who we are as Americans. So in my early thirties, I was a single mom. Um, I wanted to live a life that had adventure and purpose and making a difference, but I also needed stability. And the foreign service was an extraordinary way to give that to myself and my daughter. Um, I've been in the foreign service for 16 years now. Um, I've served in, in Mexico and at the UN, um, in South Africa, in India, um, in DC, um, every single place working on issues that I, you know, come to learn about and care about passionately in the space of food security. Um, since I've been in Sri Lanka for two years, the country has gone through an economic and political crisis that changed the trajectory of people's lives here. And we saw very dramatically during the crisis, there were kind of a couple of things that happened. The government changed its import policy on fertilizer, which absolutely destabilized the agricultural sector and led, you know, patty farmers, family farmers, you know, just like rice production plummeted. Um, and then there was a, a you know, government crisis and economic crisis um, that devalued the rupee and, and people's ability to buy food was much less. And it watching a, a, this beautiful island and the well-being of people change very quickly was hugely instructional. And so over the last couple of years, I've worked very closely with USAID, my colleagues at USAID, my colleagues at USDA and other places in the U.S. government. Um, both to um, support the assistance work that we're doing and then to work on longer term uh, solutions to some of the food uh, crises here. And so I guess we'll be talking about that today. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Perfect. I Thank you, Heidi. And thank you, um, Ronit and Paul. I love hearing uh, U.S. diplomat origin stories because we all have different stories and how we came in. 
So thank you for sharing. And um, before we go into more questions, please, I wanna encourage all of our online participants um, to start writing your questions into the chat box. We have a Google Doc that I'm monitoring and I wanna see some questions in there. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing from you. All right, so let's move on to some questions. The first one is for all three panelists. Um, how do you see your role and the role of your bureau or mission or post in shaping and implementing US foreign policy and actions on the topic of global food security? So once again, we'll start off with Roni. Over to you. Great, thanks, Naomi. So um, as I noted earlier, I'm with USAID, but the US mission to the United Nations agencies based in Rome um, incorporates both USDA, USAID, and State Department. And our mission and the role that I play um, in the mission is in providing a little bit of programmatic and administrative financial oversight to the, the Rome-based agencies. And those agencies are um, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the UN International Fund for Agricultural Development, and the World Food Program. My role in particular is focused on long-term development. However, here at the mission, we're looking at both emergency humanitarian assistance as well as long-term development assistance. We're looking at, in general, kind of multilateral diplomacy is what we like to refer to it. Um, we see um, ourselves as contributing to high-level policy dialogue um, that applies across the globe on uh, many levels, whether it's financial oversight um, to programs that we support through US government, um, or it is a programmatic implementation, um, US government programs, um, we are highly engaged with our development partners here in Rome. We are negotiating terms of foreign of, um, policy reform that's implemented through the UN organizations. Um, specifically for myself, I am looking at long-term policy reform that isn't um, about how we're going to feed people tomorrow, but more about how we're going to feed people in the long run. Um, I do have colleagues here and we as a mission are looking at, at emergency and humanitarian funding. Um, but for my specific role, I am more focused on the long-term development. Um, we like to um, support our UN organizations um, and ensure that they're aligning with a lot of our US priorities and our own policies. Um, a lot of times this works out. Um, a lot of times it takes a lot of negotiating, not just among um, uh, the UN organizations clearly, but among all of its member countries. And those include our donor partners, as well as our partners across the globe in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and so forth. So, um, um, I'm trying to think of, sorry, what else I might be able to add to that. Um, I might just leave it at that for right now and let my other colleagues go ahead. No, that was a great overview. A multilateral diplomacy is different, that's for sure. And we have to negotiate with a lot of different entities, whether it be with other member states or the UN agencies themselves. So thank you so much for, Nate, for giving that overview. Um, so same question to Paul over um, at the US Department of State. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so the Office of Agricultural Policy, we're in the Bureau of Economic Affairs. You heard uh, Special Envoy Dr. Kerry Fowler's uh, video address. We work extremely closely with his office. He's doing some cool things like VAX and, and research and development. Um, we do a lot of the uh, long-term food security efforts, the planning, the day-to-day, -day, the engagements, bilateral, multilateral negotiations. Um, I have people uh, right now out at the Codex meetings. Um, we go to different UN meetings. Sometimes uh, folks get to go to Rome, engage in various meetings and support the negotiations there. Um, we're all over the world uh, all the time. I'm always looking around, can't find half my team members because they're off at a meeting somewhere in Asia or uh, Africa or Latin America or Europe, right? 
that's what we do. We're out doing diplomacy. Um, let me say just a little bit about the team I lead, right? Because we're a part of the interagency um, and we're here in Washington. So we're we're fighting those interagency battles, but it's really a lot of collaboration with folks, right? We work extremely closely with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They're our most important partner because they're the experts on agriculture in the United States. So we work with them all the time on uh, pretty much a daily basis. Um, U.S. Trade Representative uh, is undertaking a lot of negotiations. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework negotiations, for example, we support them on that. We're we're engaged. You know, we're we're out there working the agricultural discussions with them. Of course, we work closely with USAID and a whole host of other uh, interagency players. Um, then I'm privileged to lead a team that's got about 18 people in it right now. Foreign service officers like myself who've come to agricultural policy for a, a period of time in our careers but then also civil service members who are experts in agricultural policy, some who've been doing this for 10, 15 years, others who've recently just joined the team. A lot of my, my folks have um, PhDs. You know, I have someone who's a veterinarian, someone else who just got a PhD in cellular and molecular biology. These are things that I can't even talk about coherently unless they give me the points and then maybe I can fake it. Um, but we have a lot of folks like that. And then we have other people, applied economics and a whole range of, of specialties. It's really kind of amazing to see the folks that we, we get. And I get people from U.S. Department of Agriculture come work with me as well. And then we work in three main areas. We work on global food security. So ensuring that, you know, U.S. policies are in place to promote food security around the world. So things like the Black Sea Grain Initiative, getting grain out of Ukraine. We spend a lot of time working on that. Um, and still do, uh, trying to ensure that Ukrainian grains and other foodstuffs get to world markets. Um, we have a biotech team that is out there working to ensure that biotechnology is promoted and that uh, when countries adopt regulations on agricultural products that might have a biotech component to it, that they do so in a science-based uh, uh, approach, not one that's just like, we don't like biotech, but one that's based rather on science. Um, this then feeds into our third uh, line of effort, which is agricultural trade promotion. So we work with U.S. companies, large and small, big ones, um, Archer Daniels, Midland, Corteva, John Deere, Caterpillar, all these big companies that you've heard of, right? We try to help them get access to foreign markets. Then little teeny tiny companies. There's a soy producer in Illinois who ships soy, tofu, other places, like really who knew until I got into this job? So we do a lot of stuff like that um, and ensure that uh, markets are open and accessible, that U.S. companies can compete there. Um, and not just that, but that globally markets are functioning so that Ukrainian grain gets to the places in Africa that it needs to be so that people have food security, so they have options um, when they are you know, trying to buy food and have access to the food and fertilizer and other things that they need. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that for, for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul, for that overview of um, the Office of Agricultural uh, Policy. Now, to finish up with this question, we turn to Heidi in Sri Lanka. Yeah, Naomi, so my role is a little bit different in that um, food security doesn't show up in my job description. Um, I'm a public affairs officer coming to Sri Lanka. My job is to take um, America, American policy and who we are and make it accessible to Sri Lankans to build bridges between our countries, whether that's through exchange programs or outreach or, um, you know, cultural preservation programs or English language teaching, um, you know, media outreach. But I'll tell you, like, that work isn't possible, or at least it's not successful when people aren't well. And the crisis that we went through in Sri Lanka a couple of years ago that I was talking about was a moment in time when, when our mission really had to turn to focus on, on what the United States needed to be able to bring um, to the Sri Lankan people, to the Sri Lankan government, to help stabilize a crisis um, and allow the kind of economic and political, um, you know, allow people to be okay so that ec economic and political reform and all the other wealth of important work that we're doing here um, you know, with our key partner in the Indo-Pacific around security, around energy, around so many other issues that we care about um, to move forward. So from where I sit, um, food security is an incredibly important issue, but it's 
it's wild to see how deeply tied it is to all the other policy issues that our that our mission is is working on and how important it has been for my colleagues and I to be able to work with Sri Lankans to address that issue to be able to have success in in, in all the other spaces that we care about here no, that is a very good point, and that's why we're so lucky to have you this late at night over in Sri Lanka on this panel to give that perspective on, um, you know, how this particular uh, U.S. policy um, priority plays out in the bilateral space. So thank you for that perspective. So once again, we're going to zoom out and talk multilateral. Um, this question is for Ronit. Uh, with the increasing number of armed conflicts and natural disasters around the world, one of the organizations that we work closely with here um, in Rome is WFP. And it's been, that organization, the World Food Program has been in the news a lot. Um, I guess, let's just take a moment for you to talk a little bit about why the work that we do within the UN system, and in your case, the Rome-based um, food and agriculture agencies is important to the US people. It's a great question and a very complex one that I will attempt to um, answer in my, my few minutes. But um, um, just to say that the US government is one of the top contributors to the, the UN Rome-based agencies. Um, and we've given a considerable amount of money to the World Food Program over the last couple of years um, due to, as Naomi mentioned, these growing conflicts, natural disasters, and so forth. Um, that's We're also giving quite a significant amount of money to FAO as well, um, because while they're not providing food, immediate food assistance, they are providing immediate agricultural assistance, which means they're providing seeds, um, other agricultural inputs, and other market um, access to communities that are also um, in the midst of either natural disasters or other armed conflicts. So both agencies are, are providing emergency response. And so Naomi's question about why is this so important to the people of the US? Well, and I think, Paul, you said this in your introduction. Um, you said global food security is national security. And that is probably one of our top reasons. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about, um, you've heard this, this kind of mantra before, but people who are living in poverty, who have no opportunities for any livelihoods, who are feeling that they have nothing in their communities for them to help advance themselves, their families, their children, they look for other opportunities. And some of those opportunities are parts of um, are, are, are kind of lead to um, joining groups that um, are welcoming of them and that sometimes are terrorist groups. Sometimes that desperation leads them to migrate um, to other parts of their regions or in some cases to the United States. And all of these have major implications on the US economy, on the US um, national safety, um, it, it delves into kind of all different aspects of, um, of US, of, 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 of the United States. And so one of the things that we're constantly looking at, especially through the agencies, uh, the USAID's, I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but all of our, our food security and our global food security programming is funded through President Obama's Feed the Future initiative, which is then, excuse me, which is also filtered under the Global Food Security Act and is and the Global Food Security Strategy. So all of our all of our work to address global food security is linked to that initiative. And so everything we're doing from migration um, in Central America um, to addressing um, extremism um, in certain parts of Africa, these are all in support of at the higher level, that 10,000 foot level, links back to, I should say, national security for the US government. So everything we do here to support addressing these short-term and long-term food security goals are ultimately helping the United States to remain a peaceful and safe 
um, place for, for, for all U.S. citizens. Um, I know I can go on and on, but um, I'll probably just stop there and, and let my colleagues um, continue. No, Ronnie, you did a good job bringing the point home of why this is important to the American people and why, especially here in Rome, we sit here to make sure that the millions or billions of dollars that we give to these UN organizations is spent well, and it's going to um, policies and programs that will, you know, attain the goal of ensuring the security of the American people and the country. So thank you for that. So let's turn to Paul. Um, the next one's for you. So with COP28 starting this week in Dubai, in fact, our keynote speaker, Dr. Fowler, is there right now, climate change and our global response is of top of mind. Um, can you comment on the nexus between climate change and food security and the role your office plays to build stronger, more resilient food systems and sustainable agricultural development? Absolutely, and thank you for the question. Uh, and as you noted, Dr. Fowler's in, in COP28 um, this uh, right now, and uh, going to discuss the VAX program now that he's already mentioned, and they'll have a whole VAX event. The secretary is going to be there and focused on that. So um, that is a part of our effort to promote stronger, you know, more resilient food systems. And of course, we work very closely with them on that. Um, and that's what his office is doing. My office uh, works on a couple of things that uh, complement a lot of this. One, of course, uh, is the biotech innovation uh, that I mentioned earlier. So we've got a whole team worked on, working on biotech. Um, biotech is going to let us, and, and biotech can be anything from, you know, switching a gene on and off within a plant to bringing genes in from, from outside a plant. Um, but it's taking that knowledge at science and then reducing the need of the plant to uh, consume water, to consume fertilizer, to consume pest or to, you know, apply pesticides or herbicides. Um, what it does is it allows farmers to be more efficient, right? Because if, uh, if you can grow corn, for example, or if you can grow um, African custard apple, which is a funny looking fruit, um, I, I had to look it up. I was kind of curious about it. Um, you know, if you can grow those with 90% less water because they take up water more efficiently, that saves you a lot and reduces your climate impact. If you can, um, you know, get a plant, corn, corn in particular, take up nitrogen 90% greater efficiency, that has a tremendous climate impact, right? A positive climate impact. Um, and so we promote biotechnology and that innovation to allow farmers to be more efficient, to produce more crops, the crops that we need to feed eight or 10 billion people by 2050 um, with fewer resources. Uh, one of the other things we do in, in our office to address, um, you know, to ensure they're more resilient food systems and address climate change and promote sustainable agricultural development is something we call digital agriculture, right? We're at an age now where you can gather up information from an array of sensors, satellites, drones, just sensors in a field. Um, you can send that uh, data up, collect it, send it to a cloud. You can process it with artificial intelligence. Then you can send it back down to all the farmers who need it. You can also send it to the companies who want to sell a product to the farmers. You can send it to the university agricultural extension service folks who are working with farmers, right, to help farmers farm more efficiently. Um, this is something that I find really interesting because my grandfather was a commercial farmer in in, uh, in Illinois, right? And he could never control the weather. He could never control the price that he got, but he could control his inputs. And so if you control your inputs and you can limit those, you can limit your fertilizer, you can limit your pesticide, you can limit your herbicide, you can use less water, you can really have a positive climate impact while producing the food, the, the greater amount of food that we're going to need for the future. So those are some of the things that we do. And of course, we work with a range of partners on this, U.S. firms, um, large and small. We work with non-governmental organizations, inter international organizations, um, and folks like the, the World Food Prize. I just was in Iowa last month at the Borlaug Dialogue, which is a huge meeting on food security, bringing people from all around the world to talk about this um, and, and focus on that next green revolution and how we're going to innovate. Um, so we do a lot of things like, like that to you know ameliorate the climate impact of farming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, it's always interesting to hear what your office is doing. It's doing a lot. And um, uh, I love how, you know, with all three of the panelists, it's kind of all intertwined, the work that you're doing either in bilateral or in multilat. And then with you, with the with your functional bureau, it's um, really good to see how everything is working together um, towards the um, priority of global food security.
So with that, um, with the time we have left, I'm gonna shift to a couple of questions that we got from the audience. Thank you for those who submitted. Um, the first question we have is, how does food loss and waste play a role in your food security efforts? Who would like to take that one? Can you repeat the question, Naomi? How, no worries. How does food loss and waste play a role in your food security efforts? So, well, I would just say that, that for us, um, when we talk about how to uh, help f countries around the world, one of the big things that we try to focus on is transportation, because in so many parts of the world, transportation is critical. You can't get the crop to market or you can't get fertilizer to the farmers. Um, right. And so that that food loss and waste is essential. And so you try to, you know, and the USAID does a lot of this work on, on developing cold chains around the world. So I'll, I'll try not to uh, jump on that for you, but we're trying to help people create the infrastructure that they need to get the food where it needs to be. So distribution is a huge part of, of what we do. Question may be more on, on waste as, you know, cause we all end up throwing out a lot of stuff. Um, I, at least I know I do, uh, unfortunately, but that's a, maybe a different part of the question, but I, that would be my, my answer to that. Um, I would just add that um, USAID does um, quite quite a bit of work um, in the area of food loss and waste, and I think it's a growing area. Um, through one of our bureaus, the Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security, launched, I think just over this last year, a um, food loss and waste like financing accelerator, which was, I think it was $10 million and it was to support micro, small, and medium enterprises to improve, um, to make investments that would reduce um, food loss and waste. And what we're looking at is, you know, food production. So we're looking at post-harvest loss, whether that's in the field or on the way to market. So something getting to the point that Paul was saying about, you know, cold chains, we're talking about within the market, um, the handling of the, the fruits and vegetables and foods. A lot of it is lost just in the handling of it. And then, of course, you know, once it's home, um, there's a lot of waste. And, and, and we in the United States are, are also managing um, this issue quite significantly. So there's definitely a lot of work um, in it um, through the UN um, Food System Summit. There was um, a, uh, a committee organized through USAID, through a couple of private sector entities to look at ways to increase awareness about food loss and waste. Um, I don't have the statistics, but it is quite significant. I think it's like 30% um, uh, of like food production could be reduced. Um, through like minor investments in some of the cold chains and, and market um, opportunities. So it is definitely something that the U.S. is taking into, um, into consideration. And I think it's a, growing, it's a growing concern. And so I actually expect to see a lot more of the discussion in USAID. Yes, thank you so much, um, Ronit, for uh, talking about food less and waste and all the initiatives that are going, especially in the, in the multilateral space when it comes to food and agriculture agencies. All right, so this question might be for Heidi. Um, do you think the largest issue in food security in Africa or in places like Sri Lanka, as Dr. Fowler said, um, the individual farmers' issues with soil and modern agriculture or more so the stability of their regions? and the safety of their farmland. I think that speaks to kind of what you said um, for the first question that was asked about, you know, the decisions that were made um, by the Sri Lankan government and how that had cascading events, uh, effects. So I'm gonna throw it to you. Sure, um, I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't think you can choose one or the other because they, both of those things matter 100%. Um, you know, government decisions like Sri Lanka's decision overnight to go organic and to remove fertilizer from the market, which, um, you know, destabilized family farmers, paddy farmers from being able to grow rice in, in the next season um, or or an economic crisis because of, um, you know, policy de decisions and a lack of accountability and transparency, you know, absolutely contributed to the food security challenges here. Um, 
but but those answers and those solutions can't rest just on the government. There's you know all the other com components as well, Naomi. So I I think it's not I think it's not one or the other. I think it's a combination of the you know infrastructure and and um, capabilities of, of individuals and then creating a, a, a policy environment, a governance environment, an economic environment um, where where folks have the opportunity to thrive. Yes, yes, very good answer. It's not just one or the other. It can be all things, but um, uh, thank you for expounding on that. We're getting a lot of questions in. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and um, ask the question of what type of educational background do careers like the ones that you all have require? And what are the academic and work experience requirements for entering into the positions that you now hold? Oh, I'll go crazy with this one, Naomi. Um, it, so, like I said, I hadn't heard of the Foreign Service in high school or in college. I worked a number of jobs after college. So I, I studied economics. I now see that there's a trajectory and that it's somewhat related. I did not know that at the time. Um, I was passionate about making a difference. I worked as an activist. I worked in you know, public policy on a state level. I organized cross-country bicycle tours to raise money and awareness for organizations that I cared about. I, I like a lot of different jobs. Um, I see that I learned along the way skills that absolutely served me in the Foreign Service, the communication piece, the getting stuff done piece, the working with a diverse group of people, the understanding communities, like all of those have me be a more successful Foreign Service officer. But what I love about the Foreign Service is that we are a cross section of, of who we are as Americans. Um, you know, there, there are absolutely people who went to Harvard and studied um international relations and have PhDs and like the smartest of things, you know, who are successful in the foreign service, but there's also, um, you know, folks who studied, I, I, like, I don't know, like anything um, that they're passionate about. What matters is that you sign up to take the foreign service exam um, and that um, you have an understanding of, of who we are, who you are, you know, history, governance, working well with people, um, getting things done, like those are the things that it takes to be successful in the foreign service. And, and I think that there's skills that you can learn from a lot of different backgrounds. So it, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's not just one right pathway, um, that there's a lot of them. And I think that's part of what makes the foreign service fantastic and, and part of what makes um, representing, re representing the United States abroad, um, like the adventure of a lifetime. If I may just add a little bit, um, um, I totally agree with everything that Heidi said. And I would say for USAID, some of the requirements are a little bit different than they are for State Department. Um, a lot of the positions that we have do require technical degrees um, and a master's degree. Um, it is uh, rare to enter into USAID without a master's degree. And I think we have a few specialist positions, but those are engineers. And we have very few engineers across the agency, unfortunately. Um, but I do agree that those technical degrees can, can be quite varied. And the work that it took to get to those degrees can also vary. And I, I agree that we're looking for people who um, are flexible and adaptable. And that's demonstrated in a lot of the work that they're doing. Um, we do have requirements for overseas experience, but yet we're, we're also looking at ways to address that because not everyone has an opportunity to go overseas. So we're looking at other experiences across the United States in communities that are underserved and, and work in those are, are can be um, equivalent to an overseas um, opportunity. So um, for myself, I studied agriculture. Um, I, I, I grew up in a non-rural, very suburban area. So for me to go into agriculture was extremely bizarre, but I went to UC Davis, which is a huge ag school, and I started moving along those lines. And for me, and then I was a Peace Corps volunteer and I became, I was an agriculture volunteer. And so for myself, it, I, I didn't go into any of it intending to do this. I didn't even know about the foreign service 
until after I finished Peace Corps, which was after my, my undergraduate degree. So for me, just as an example, I just kept rolling into all of these opportunities, but um, I've seen people from who started as, um, you know, law degrees who have ended up doing, you know, policy um, work at USA. And, you, you know, there's just so many opportunities and different paths to get there. But I just had to highlight that for USAID, a lot of um, the requirements, because it is quite competitive, have you like applying for like with technical degrees. So I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much, ladies, for those um, for those interventions. So um, we have a couple of interesting questions. I don't know if we're going to get to both of them, but the first one I wanted to pose to the group is how do you navigate cultural differences when it comes to policy reform and development? Can you share an example of a situation where cultural understanding played an important role towards a positive outcome? Uh, I, I would just say, I mean, recently we, we're undertaking some, some negotiations with a number of other countries here because we want to do something in an international body. And, uh, you know, it's a range of countries that I've had to approach here in town. Um, and so these are all people who work with Americans, but all have their own, you know, cultural background. And I try to take that on board. And so my approach to each one, and there's a, it's a dozen different countries, has been a little different, right? The, some of the European members that I've approached, pretty direct, right? Because I know that's exactly what they want. Um, others, you know, it's a good thing that I got to know them before I had to approach them on this topic, because we have at least can say, oh, we've met before. I'm not walking in the door and asking them to do something, understanding that that's culturally uh, difficult for them to do, right? If you don't have a relationship with them already, you can't. And then for others, you know, the approach has been um, not uh, so direct, but rather beat around the bush. And then they say, oh, well, what if we did this? Oh, why? That's a great idea. It just happens to be exactly what I said to the European, but it's not what I could raise with this other person, right? Because I need them to come to that conclusion themselves. So we've been doing that here recently over the last few months. It's been uh, it's fun to watch and think about. All right, so we have like a couple minutes left. And before I wrapped up, I just wanted to give the floor back to the panelists at any final words you wanted to impart on our audience here. Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> I don't, but I mean, maybe if you want to throw that other question at us. Oh, sure. Okay, real quick. What is a book you recommend that addresses global food security and or policy? <laughs> did Carrie Fowler write one? I anything Carrie Fowler. Said. <laughs> I'm sure he did. How about everyone Google anything that Dr. Fowler has written and, and take a look. <laughs> so I, I find I always recommend not necessarily a book, but I always recommend people read The Economist because it covers things like global food security. But the writing is so good. It prepares you extremely well. If you want to join the Foreign Service, if you want to work in the State Department or USAID, any, if you want to get into government service and you want to be an effective writer, you look at The Economist and how they write. Um, and then just reading it for the topics and the information as, and the current events on a daily basis. I mean, that's how I got through the Foreign Service exam. So. I, I would just add, I, it's, it's so unfortunate I can't see everyone because I really love to like see people's reactions and faces and um, that's how I communicate best. But without seeing all of you happy, wonderful people, um, I would just say I'm really excited for where you're at. There's so many opportunities. I would say try not to say no to any of the opportunities because sometimes you don't know what you want to do. You don't know which direction you're going to go in. Look at everything as an opportunity for learning and growing. And if you move in one direction and you don't like it, there's always going to be another opportunity. We've had some really amazing interns come through here and they're just trying everything to figure out what, what they like best. And I, I just encourage you to like open up and, and take on like different opportunities. And I just wish you all the best of luck. Great. Thank you, Ronit. And with that, I think that's a good note for us to wrap. I want to thank you once again, the our lovely panel of experts, Ronit, Paul, and Heidi. Your insights were invaluable, and I'm sure our online participants got a lot out of the discussion today.
We really, really appreciate you lending your time and expertise. Um, and thank you all in our audience for your time, attention, and participation. Um, next up are our breakout sessions. Um, if you want to learn more about the work of the department and or get more information about scholarships, internships, fellowships, and employment, stick around for our next session in our series of interactive breakout sessions, which includes for the first time as a special breakout session for those interested in careers with one of the UN agencies featured today, the Food and Agriculture Organization. But before I bid a final farewell, I'd like to invite um, those on the call to join us in January for the next seminar on entrepreneurship, innovation, and the CHIPS Act. And with that, I'm pleased to hand the virtual mic to my colleague from the Department's Bureau of Global Talent Management, Diplomat in Residence for the DC Metro Region, John Finkelman. Over to you, John. I have a really fun job in that I get to sit into session in sessions like the one we just had, um, that in which my colleagues talk about some really awesome uh, areas of policy and and coordination which they undertake. Um, and I get to then speak to people about how, once they've heard of this career, they have the opportunity to actually follow on with a career in the Foreign Service. Um, rather than going through my uh, resume, suffice to say that when I told my older brother that I was going to join the Foreign Service and I wanted to do everything I could to take the Foreign Service exam, he said to me back in many years ago, uh, he said, but Johnny, why would anyone ever want to go anywhere that didn't have a Taco Bell? And ever since then, he, my brother, who, who lives out west and enjoys his Taco Bell, has taken advantage of the fact that I've gone around the world to visit me wherever I may need to go, he may need to go, uh, to see his brother and his family. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity. Let's go to the next slide very quickly, please. Um, and so why work in foreign affairs? in general, and why work for the Department of State? Well, as you can see, aside from being the oldest cabinet agency and leading on all policy issues, we have a tremendous opportunity to see the world. You see on the screen here, a division of the nature of labor that is contained in the Department of State. The largest number of people you see there on the bottom of the right are the locally employed staff. These are the people that we depend on wherever we go around the world to do the job of keeping the embassy running, keeping our missions going. But what I'm going to be focusing on with you in the next 10 minutes or so is basically that group of roughly 25,000 people listed as both foreign service and civil service employees who work as United States citizens for the Department of State. You'll also notice a division among the Foreign Service, roughly two thirds to one third of generalist versus specialist, which we'll go into in greater depth. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. It was mentioned earlier in the session how the Department of State is determined to make sure that diversity is part of our organization. Um, when you think about it, if we're going to be the diplomatic core for a nation of 330 million people, the best thing we can do is represent all of those people and that our face be the face of the nation that we represent. Uh, since uh, Secretary Blinken's arrival in 2021, one of his main focus has been to make sure that we are attracting and maintaining a broad variety of Americans on our team. And as a diplomat in residence in charge of recruitment, uh, one of my responsibilities is to make sure that the word gets out in sessions like this to as broad a group of possible uh, as to the opportunities available. Let's go to the next slide. Obviously, there are many great things that come with a career in the Department of State. Listed here on this page are just a few. Um, 
one of the important things that I would point out is the caliber and quality of people you'll find yourself working with. Uh, it is a tremendous opportunity that we have. Let's go to the next slide. A few of the, uh, the key components, I should say, the, the, um, the nuts and bolts of the work that we do, can, you can see here. The benefits and the things provided to us as we go through our careers are considerable. Many people don't realize the nature of the benefits, particularly when we're serving overseas housing, education, sick and annual leave, many different opportunities for family members in addition to seeing the world. Let's go to the next slide. The generalist career track in the Foreign Service, which is the one that I suspect most of the people on this call are interested in, can be divided into five different career tracks. Uh, we can go into those in greater depth as we go into our breakout session, but to su suffice to say that individuals, when they're coming into the Foreign Service, must state their preferred career track upon applying for the Foreign Service Officer Examination process. You need to determine how you will display your skills for the duration of your mid-career, mid-level career path. So essentially, you're making a decision early on as to what the nature of your work is going to do. As, as many of my colleagues on, on this call who were participating in the, in the previous session uh, mentioned, their focus being that of food security was largely in the economic area. However, one of our colleagues mentioned that she was a public diplomacy officer in charge of getting the word out. I myself am a management code officer in charge of the functioning and operations of our mission and our organization. Um, we can go into greater depth on those in the breakout session as you desire. Going to the next screen, on the specialist side of the house, the options are many. We hire foreign service specialists to, to employ in their career demonstrated skills in which they have a pre-existing expertise. And on this and the next few slides you'll see are various of those, uh, those careers that are possible within the organization. Uh, the ones I've marked in blue on these pages are those for which we have a continual opening Whereas those that remain in white are those which we advertise for on a sporadic basis as the need arrives. So on this page, of course, we see that information management specialists, we are always looking for people for information management capabilities, in addition to security and construction executives. Let's go to the next slide. Though I don't think it applies to many people on this call, as you can imagine, we are hiring people to provide medical services for us in disparate locations around the world and in Washington, D.C. And on to the next slide, we see also that individuals have to, um, we need to have individuals who have demonstrated skills in finances, human resources, facilities management, and I would note at the bottom, the office management specialist position. That which in my generation we used to call secretaries, but these are the people who run offices and make sure things operate. Uh, we continue to have that as a permanent opening and advertise for individuals who can cover the administrative and operational support of our offices, both domestic and overseas. On to the next slide. Finally, we see that in order to make sure that our first priority of the security of our people and facilities being, being maintained, we continuously look for individuals who will be full, willing to fulfill roles as special agents in diplomatic security, in addition to their colleagues as diplomatic couriers, which occasionally come open. And finally, you'll see a few specialties in the public diplomacy area, which are rather rare, but nevertheless, we continue to advertise for them. On to the next slide. So the process, 
Um, if you want to become a foreign service officer, you must take the exam. You have to apply for it. As noted here on step number one, you have to choose a career track. You need to put all your paperwork together and send it in. After taking the test, your narratives and your examination scores will be reviewed to determine whether or not you'll be invited on to step number two, which is the assessment, previously known as the oral examination, during which you'll have the opportunity over the course of a day to take some case management, group and structured interview exercises in order to demonstrate your capabilities. If you successfully get through those first two steps, you will be asked to provide information that will require medical and security reviews. And finally, your entire package once completed will determine whether or not uh, you are suitable for the Foreign Service, after which you're placed on a register listed as step number four, from which the Department of State, as its training and orientation needs arise, will pull in order to invite individuals into the Foreign Service as a generalist. On to the next slide. The Civil Service is slightly different from the Foreign Service in its intake process. Those who are interested in working for the Department of State, but who aren't necessarily interested in moving around for their entire life, have plenty of opportunities with us in the Civil Service, which is largely based in Washington, D.C. and other places within the United States, depending on the nature of the work. Um, those jobs, are the way in which those jobs are, are obtained is similar to that for other agencies and departments within the federal government, in that individuals usually find them via usajobs.gov and go through the evaluation um, and suitability processes along with interviews and clearance granting um, that one would expect coming into such a job. Let's go on to the next screen. Another program which is available right now, which is quite interesting and maybe, maybe an option for some of you out there, is a five-year limited career appointment as a consular fellow, which has been opened up to meet the increasingly demanding need that we have overseas of individuals with Arabic, Spanish, Chinese, and Portuguese capabilities who would be willing to serve in those positions for a five-year period. It is uh, mutually exclusive from any pursuit of another position, either in the civil or foreign service, but allows for an individual simultaneously to get a taste of what life would be like as a foreign service officer overseas. And again, I can address any questions you may have regarding this consular fellowship program uh, during our breakout sessions. On to the next screen. Uh, the way in which individuals are, are um, evaluated in these foreign service examination processes are based on 11 different dimensions that you see listed here. Um, the evaluations of candidates' capabilities, characteristics, and abilities to work within these areas are critical for the successful candidate. Um, once again, we can address those, but I just wanted you to have a view on those. Moving through and making sure that we've left enough time for the breakouts, um, I'll quickly go through the next slides, um, summarizing, of course, that we are as I, as I said earlier, we are always open for applications for people looking for consular fellowships, information management positions, office management positions, and diplomatic security positions. The Foreign Service Generalist examination process is thrice yearly. With the next one starting in February, applications will open up uh, we'll start receiving those applications on December 18th. And then on all other positions, you'll see throughout the course of the year, uh, announcements coming out as needed. On to the next slide, entering into non-employment situations, 
And I think we'll end on this slide in the interest of time and we'll go into greater depth on any of the options after that. Um, we have plenty of opportunities for internships, both graduate and undergraduate, as you see listed here, graduate fellowships, uh, and finally, various study abroad opportunities also sponsored by the Department of State, one of those which may look familiar to those on this call particularly. Um, simply put, internships, the demand is, is very high, applications are heavy, uh, the Department of State has changed to an entirely paid student internship process, which has simply increased the number of individuals who've applied. The, the periods of internships echo the normal United States college uh, semester schedule with availability in spring, summer, and fall. As you can imagine, summer is highly, highly sought. Uh, chances for getting in, in in the spring and the fall uh, seem to be a bit better for those who can mold their academic calendar accordingly. Uh, similarly, we have opportunities. I would point out particularly the virtual student of federal service uh, internship program, which is quite convenient for those of you who cannot break away, but would, who would like to get a toe in the water. This allows for you to remain in school where you are, but have a regularized uh, interaction with, with people in the Department of State working on projects and jobs from where you are sitting. I would call your, those to your attention. Um, rather than go any further through this presentation at this point, what I would do is I'll wrap up at this point and and turn it back over to you, Ace, for determination as to how you're going to divide breakout groups. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, appreciate that. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, we are now going to launch into our breakout rooms. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to go into these breakout rooms that you see here on the screen to speak with our speakers more in a smaller group. Uh, first one, we're going to have a breakout session with John, talk about State Department careers and student paths, uh, Sibel with Life and Foreign Service, with Dan when it comes to scholarship programs, uh, Susan with Life and Work and Civil Service, and then Miho and Ellen with careers with the FAO. Uh, just as a reminder, the breakout rooms will not be recorded, but it will resume recording once we get back into the main room. And please make sure to use the raise hand feature in, in Zoom in case you have any questions. Uh, but ultimately, you now should be able to choose uh, which breakout room you'd like to attend. And you're you're able to switch from uh, one breakout room to the next if you'd like. But let us know if you have any questions with that, and we can help you out with that. And well, hopefully we're getting most uh, people that are that are that were in the breakout rooms uh, back with us. Um, again, thank you very much for being here. Um, everyone, my name is Dan Paterini. I'm uh, Foreign Service Officer with the Department of State. I'm currently assigned as one of the outreach officers in USA Study Abroad. So I have the great privilege of working on programs like Gilman, or like the Critical Schol Language Scholarship Program, and putting together events like this. Um, I really appreciate everybody that's stayed and, and joined the breakout sessions. Uh, I was in mid-sentence. Uh, we were having such a fantastic conversation. Uh, so I, I'm sorry that the technology just kind of yanks you and says we've got to go back to the main room. Um, I will uh, thank everyone who participated today from our keynote, uh, Dr. Fowler, to our expert panel who joined us from around the world, to our diplomat in residence, John Dinkelman, and to each of the folks that offered a breakout session uh, Sibel Cochran, Susanna Guzman, and uh, uh, I guess, uh, sorry, Miho and Ellen from the from the um, FAO. Um, we will continue this this program. So the 2023 Inside U.S. Foreign Policy series uh, began in February. It's going to continue through January, uh, late January of next year. The next and final, the sixth and final of this series. Uh, will take place in late January, likely. It will focus on entrepreneurship, innovation, and the CHIPS Act. 
Uh, details will be forthcoming. So bookmark that in your, your, your uh, bookmark the Gilman Scholarship Foreign Policy Seminars and uh, take a look at that. Anybody that attended today will be invited, of course, to, to attend in January. So spread the word. Um, on behalf of everybody involved, I want to thank my colleagues at IIE. I want to thank each of you, um, the, the participants, um, Heidi Manley, the USA Study Abroad uh, branch chief who opened us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Last thing I will say, please evaluate us. Please tell us what we can do better. Please tell us uh, how we can improve, what you liked, uh, what you'd like to see more of areas that you think we can do better in, and we'll, we'll take that into uh, account. Um, it's through those evaluations that we, we get better. Um, with that, thank you very much for coming. That concludes uh, our seminar for today. We appreciate it. Hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you have a restful holiday season, and I wish you a happy new year. It's coming faster than you'd think. So thank you, everyone. Take care.